Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the second episode of Barbroians, a podcast miniseries exploring the filmography of the Barbarian Brothers. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is my brother in flexing, JD. Chicken bone, chicken bone, lucky, lucky chicken bone. Chicken bone, chicken bone, chicken bone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we are here to discuss the film Think Big which is technically a 1989 film, though it looks like it was released in Italy in October of 1989, but wasn't released in the U.S. until March of 1990. JD, had you ever seen Think Big before? I did. I had thought Double Trouble was the film I had seen with the Mm. Barbarian Brothers before, but I'm pretty sure that I was confusing it with this one because I remember a lot of this movie. I was kind of surprised. All of a sudden, the memories were just flooding back to me. So yeah, I had a lot of fond memories as a kid and we'll discuss whether or not those memories hold up. I think it'll be an interesting conversation. Mm. I had never seen it before. I had heard of this movie through other circumstances, which I will get to, but I had never actually watched it. Quick little bit of production history on this. And I honestly can't tell if this film ever got a theatrical release or ended up going straight to video. I couldn't find any info of it on Box Office Mojo, so I really don't know. The film is the directorial debut of John Turtletaub. After this and the German car comedy Driving Me Crazy, he entered the mainstream with the 90s triple hit classics of Three Ninjas, Cool Runnings, and While You Were Sleeping. (laughs) Which, silly as they are to look back on, all three of which were gigantic hit films. Oh, yeah. And it's just a weird, like, mishmash of films, especially with this one as the lead in. I mean, because Three Ninjas was one of those odd little kid exploitation films that no one expects much of and then became a huge hit. Cool Runnings was just the lovable sports comedy that awed an entire generation Mm -hmm. and while you were sleeping was the film right after speed that shot sandra bullock into being a mainstream star right i quite love all three (laughs) and he's since gone on to direct the films phenomenon instinct the kid the national treasure films the sorcerer's apprentice and last vegas and as of this recording currently has a film that's about to come out the meg which is jason statham versus a giant shark What else do you need in your life other than Jason Statham fighting a giant shark? I remember watching the trailer to that. I mean, like, this looks terrible, but fun. And then I'm like, oh, oh, it's John Turtletop. (laughs) (laughs) Because I don't think I've seen Instinct and I haven't seen Las Vegas yet, but I've seen pretty much his entire filmography. I never saw Phenomenon. I never saw Instinct. I never saw The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Oh, that's a fun one. And Last Vegas I've never seen, but I think I've seen the rest of them. He's also an executive producer on and directed the pilots for the TV series Jericho, Harper's Island, and Rush Hour. I never did watch Rush Hour, but I love Harper's Island and Jericho. Mm. The original story for this film was by Jim Wynorski and R.J. Robertson. Wynorski is an infamous schlock movie director, one of my favorites, going back to the 80s, and he did films like Chopping Mall, Not of This Earth, Return of Swamp Thing, The Munchie Franchise, Vampirella, The Bear Wench Project, Alabama Jones and the Busty Crusade, <laughs> Dino Croc vs. Super Gator, Piranaconda, Sexipede, Scared Topless, and Cobra Gator. <laughs> and that's like among like 120 films he's done. Oh, wow. He'll do like B-movie monster flicks and softcore porn. And he just churns stuff out. And R.J. Robinson was his frequent co-writer for the first decade of their career. And it's worth pointing out that the two of them in 1993, a few years after this, also did a similar kids adventure film, Little Miss Millions, about a teenage runaway, where basically they recycled their original script for this movie. And the script was then rewritten by Edward Kovacs, who wrote the 80s women in prison rock and roll comedy Jailbird Rock, which is a thing that exists, (laughs) and Extro 2, The Second Encounter. Okay, then. 
and it was then rewritten by John Turtletaub and his then writing partner David Tausick, and those two again collaborated on Driving Me Crazy, but then Tausick broke off and killed his career with terrible sci-fi TV movies like Brave New World and Virtual Nightmare. Hmm. And that's all that I got for production notes. So anything else to add before I dive into the synopsis? Nope, let's do it. Teen genius Holly Sherwood is part of a private institute run by Dr. Bruckner, which offers advanced students a free education in exchange for owning the patents of any new technology the teenagers develop. Holly has invented a remote control which can turn any electronic device on or off, and when she learns that Bruckner has already sold it to a pair of arms dealers, she decides to make a break for it. Rafe and Victor are meathead identical twin truck drivers who have built such a reputation for being late that their bosses installed a clock in their cab with the threat of firing them if they don't make their next delivery on time. On top of which, they still owe a final payment on their truck and are constantly fending off Repo Man Sweeney in the hopes that this next delivery will finally set them square. The delivery is to pick up a trailer full of toxic waste from the institute run by David Bruckner, during which Holly sneaks on board. The brothers initially try to drop the girl off so as not to get caught up in any trouble, but when Bruckner's goons keep trying to abduct her, the brothers can't help but stick around to protect her. So they have to get her to her boyfriend's house in California with enough time to get their cargo delivered, while constantly fending off Bruckner's goons and Sweeney, getting up to shenanigans with both their muscles and the magic remote control, and then Holly's worried teacher Irene Marsh shows up and falls for whichever brother isn't already in a relationship with the waitress who keeps trying to sleep with the wrong brother. Rafe and Vic end up missing their delivery and losing their truck, but they save Holly and the remote, and with her genius, she starts up a new company with them as the head drivers. As they live happily ever after, Bruckner is dragged into the backseat of the arms dealer's limo, and Sweeney discovers his hair falling out as he's been poisoned by the truckload of leaking toxic waste. The end. What a happy ending that is. Oh boy. So JD, do you recommend Think Big? Ah, uh, jeez. This is a hard question. I have a lot of nostalgia for this film. I'm pretty sure it was on HBO a lot as a kid. I remember watching it several times. And there's parts I really do enjoy. I think the brothers are still just as charming as ever. I think there's a lot of really great character actors here. I just think a lot of the jokes are badly edited and paced. Some of it really works, but I think a lot of the comedy just falls flat when it could have been really great. I mean, it's definitely schlocky great, but it could have been enjoyably schlocky great. And I think it just doesn't quite get there. So I'm going to give this a not recommend, but just barely. It's right on the edge. I am going to recommend it, but again, it is kind of right on the edge. I agree with you on a lot of it. I had a lot of fun with this movie. The plot moves along enjoyably. There's a lot of fun character bits. I genuinely laughed throughout the film. And the brothers are just so charming. But there is a lot of flatness, too. There's a lot of scenes where it's kind of shot flat. The cuts hold too long. It just kind of drags. The score is really bad and doesn't help. Mm -hmm. It could have been a much better movie than it is. However, I still think it's a fun time. And if you kind of look through it through the eyes of like the 10-year-old audience that it was meant for, well, there's a few bits that are maybe a little out of place in terms of not quite being right for that audience. This is a film I would have loved when I was 10. Yeah. And I did love it when I was probably about 10 at that yeah. time. So, And I think there's enough fun to be had here that, yeah, I'm, I'm going to recommend it. So why don't we just go ahead and start right off with, so what do you think about the Barbarian Brothers in this one? How do you think they came off in this next stage in their career? Like I said, I think they're still just as charming as last time. I think in The Barbarians, I kind of got the impression that a lot of that film was just them goofing around. This is them probably being a little bit more structured as far as where the script was going. I feel like there's a lot less ad-libbing. Mm. They're just enjoyable. They're giant meatheads, but every time they're on screen, even when the jokes fall flat, I'm laughing with them. I think what's nice is that for all of their dude bro meathead humor, there is a genuine sweetness to them. Mm -hmm. It's this whole thing about how they're really angry that they had to stop and help this pregnant woman who's giving birth because they have to get their delivery, but they still helped her. Yeah. <laughs> they still took time to bring her to the hospital. They don't want to ruin their schedule and get caught up in trouble by helping this kid. But dang it, she needs help and they're going to help this kid, you know? I liked how sweet they were. They're fun. They're rowdy. I love a lot of their shtick. Like, we keep cutting to the truck and they're just killing time driving across country by, like, singing the Beverly Hillbillies theme or singing 99 Bottles of Beer on the Wall. Or a really messed up version of the hip bone is connected to the whatever bone. The because... liver bone's connected to the kidney bone. <laughs> yeah. But it's fun. I also love they have all these weird props in their truck, you know, like the mustache glasses or the giant fur hat or the rain sticks that they shake in order to make their good luck song, you know? 
they're energetic, so lively and fun, and just look so ridiculous. Right. I think it embraces it, and they do bounce off each other well, and I still can't tell you which one is which. They kind of try to help you by one is wearing the suspender shirt and the other one has the open shirt. Right. I think Victor is the slightly goofier one and Rafe is the one who's a little bit more angry. Like he's the one who wants to get back on the road and get the job done. And Victor's the one who will put on the Garajo glasses or is playing Operation while they're driving the truck. Yeah. Again, this is what makes me glad I did this project, because I think there is something there. I think there is a genuine reason why the Barbarian Brothers were given an opportunity to star in films, because they are fun to watch. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And not in a way where you're laughing at them, because they are ridiculous, but they're ridiculous in a way that you're embracing them and are like, you're laughing with them. You're not just like pointing and mocking of God, look at these idiot lunkheads. They're just really fun and charming while also being lunkheads. They're clearly in on the joke. There's like, there's the whole line of, don't think you can take advantage of us because we're two big dumb guys. We're not. We're two huge dumb guys. Yeah. Or even the bit where she, I'm sorry, I hit you in the head. It's okay. I might not have much brains, but they're tough. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. See, and it's like throughout the film, I was laughing. It is a funny movie. I had so many moments where lines like that make me laugh. Bits where they just suddenly pull out some random shtick make me laugh. Sometimes the problem when you have athletes on films is they just kind of stand there stiffly and deliver their lines and you're kind of editing around them. They are people you can hold the camera on and they'll bounce off each other. They'll actually listen and react to something in the scene. They are actually yeah. not doing bad jobs acting. Yeah. And even if they're in the background, they're usually doing some little business or mm-hmm. something. Maybe not shake up the status quo, but at least they clearly are not just waiting for their line to be delivered. They actually are acting. Yeah. I even love the bit where it's like the one has to go back to give birth to the baby and he like puts on a baseball cap and the catcher's mitt. And he's like, come on, bring it home. Bring it home. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that one made me laugh really hard. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing I have to say is it's a comedy that I laughed at. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, recently I watched Baywatch. It's one of those films that's like, I can appreciate where a lot of the jokes are coming from. I can appreciate how the scene's put together. I can appreciate the actors here. I did not actually laugh at a single thing in the movie. Mm. And this is one where it's like, this is stupid. This is silly. But Lord, I laughed at it. Yeah. (laughs) And everyone felt like they were having a fun time. And again, it's like the Barbarian Brothers are a really enjoyable lead pair. Yeah. If this had been the pilot for a TV series where it's the Barbarians are on a road having an adventure when their truck stops at every stop along the way, I would probably tune in for a few seasons. Oh, I think I would have watched every episode, especially back in the day when this was coming out. That would have been perfect. Because it's like, even though the jokes are not really that good of jokes, they're being delivered in a way that's really fun. Yeah, I think that we honest, they're better at delivery than some of the established character yeah. actors, because I think they know exactly what type of film they're in. And I think that's the thing that throws people off the Barbarian Brothers. You go into a thing with the Barbarian Brothers and you expect them to be like what I mentioned, you know, the kind of stiff athlete that's just reading their line off of a cue card. And it's like, no, they're actually really delivering stuff and emoting and they're very physically active throughout their scenes. It doesn't feel like they're editing around them. It feels like they put a camera on them and, hey, you get some good stuff to play with. They're performers. They are genuine performers. Absolutely. Got it. It's hard to believe we're already halfway through this project because this is already making me want like another dozen films during the Barbarian Brothers, whether they're good or bad. Yeah, no, I would totally. I think there's a couple that you said that are not available to the public. Yeah. If those ever managed to make their way to us, we would totally review them, guys. Yeah. Hint, hint out there. Or if the Barbarians, if you want to come and be interviewed, we'd totally love to do that. Oh, God. I would adore it just to really hear some of the stories behind all this. That would be fun. Yeah. Hell, I mean, we've kind of skipped over some of the stuff where they just had like little bit roles and guest on things. If I can manage to pull that together, I almost want to do a fifth episode of the show. <laughs> just look at the small stuff. I'm down for that. We'll see what I can get my hands on. But I also got to say what I love about like the action scenes in this movie is just how much they get their asses kicked while also kicking everyone else. Everything feels like a real fight. You know, it feels like it's just kind of awkward, kind of wobbling around before you get your hit in. They're getting hurt just as much as they're hurting. They're really funny fight scenes. Yeah, it's a lot of slapstick. But it's not like wooga 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 slapstick. No, no, but they're aware that it's okay for them to get sucker punched every once in a while. And they still get their hits in. And usually when they do, their hits are a lot harder than what the other guys, but they're not afraid of... Because I know like there's a lot of action stars who are like... Don't ever let me get hit on camera. Yeah. For them, they're like, yeah, okay. They get sucker punched like in the fight in the airport or yeah. whatever. I just love that scene where Rafe is going after the guy who grabbed the girl and he's dragging her out of the airport. And Vic just looks down at his brother, just shakes his head and walks past yeah. and then goes after the guy. 
it's great performances, or at least great comedy performances. Yeah. I even love bits where they're getting attacked during the night and one brother runs after them while the other brother has like two guys and a chain wrapped around his neck and it looks like he's being taken out, but he's holding on. And he's like, it's okay. I got these two. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And then one of my favorite bits is in the fight with Richard Keel, where it's like Richard Keel and one of the brothers both pick up these two metal rods and the very first time they hit them against each other, they drop them because it hurts their hands so much. Yeah, it's like, let's not do that again. No, yeah. that hurts. <laughs> that was just such a wonderful moment. And it's, it's really clever and inventive, some of the stuff that they do in their fights. And it's like, these are such awkwardly realistic fights in that no one is really doing a good job at <laughs> each other, and yet they're so fun to watch. Right. And it, well, it makes sense. Like, just because you're a big guy doesn't mean that you know how to fight necessarily. Oh, yeah. I mean, you have an advantage as far as like just pure raw strength. Yeah. Once you get that deck in, you're good, but it's going to take you a little while to get that deck in if someone is moving around you fast. Like, I love how they're fighting the martial arts guy right. who's just like whipping around and doing all these movements and the other brother's just kind of like, what? And then just decks him once. Right. It's fun. The fight scenes are fun. I love all those. And I even love like the big stunt where the one has to try to jump on the truck while he's riding on the roof of the car. Yeah. And you can tell like that's the actor. I'm sure at least a few times you can tell like that's the actor there on the car. Yeah, he's probably strapped in, but still. You're going to have to get some really good padding and a wig to get a stunt man to be able to double the preparing brush. Yeah, exactly. One thing I just want to throw in is we both mentioned the editing of this movie and how, you know, it's very basic editing and sometimes yeah. it can be very dull. The editor of this only did 11 movies, which include Three Ninjas Kick Back. <laughs> he didn't even do the Turtle Top one. He came back for one of the sequels. And Basketball. Oh, wow. And Dennis the Menace Strikes Again for direct video <sighs> Yeah, there's a lot of weird cuts and scenes that just come out of nowhere or the music just yeah. jumps in. There's no like soft buildup. I don't know. It's just really not well edited. Yeah. And especially as the editing, John Turtletaub, you know, it's kind of surprising he went on to where he did, where almost all of this film is just done in very simple, static wide shots. Mm -hmm. It's very basic, depends on whatever the camera's holding on. If it's not holding on anything interesting, it's going to be dull and flat. If it's holding on something that's fun and exciting, it'll be fun and exciting. It's kind of entirely reliant on whatever it is that's actually on camera time. And the score is just such a simple, repetitive little synth tune that you only notice it when there's nothing else to notice. We should probably mention the opening song. Oh, yeah. The Think Big rap song. With the Barbarian Brothers singing, at least as far as I could tell. Yeah, no, that is the Barbarian Brothers who also wrote the song. Oh, and that kind of fits. Feels like it's their song. It's kind of hilarious. Well, one of the Paul brothers has continued with poetry and songwriting. Okay. And hopefully those are better. It was just very much of that era of late 80s, early 90s. Hey, rap is a thing. White people can do it too, right? Right. And having a song that's attached to the title of the film that was just written for the film. I wish I had written down some of the lyrics because they're just so basic. It's almost, I am the Barbarian Brothers and I'm here to say, I'm here to talk to you in the rapping way or something. Almost that level of basic. It's hilarious. Wow, I'm trying to Google. I can't even find the lyrics online anywhere. That's rare. Yeah. I can't imagine that the single for this went very high on the charts. <laughs> no, no. But I love how it's like the song is playing in the opening, it's playing in the closing. It was actually released. There is a video online that is worth digging up of the Barbarian Brothers and Richard Keel on a Japanese talk show where they're not only responding to awkwardly translated interviews, but they do a bench press demonstration and do a live performance of this song. Oh. With Richard Keel himself doing those deep voiced bits where it's like, bing, bing, you know? Oh, I've got to find this. I will include it in the show notes to the episode. It's worth a watch, especially just by seeing how awkward everyone is with all these Japanese questions flying. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked it up. Think Big is a song that has five credited writers. Okay. David Paul, Peter Paul, Tim Kimber, Kevin Monroe, and Bud Rizzo. I know nothing about any of these people. So. Yeah, I, was say, I, I don't know how to respond to that other than yeah. just say, like, I kind of want some more. I kind of don't. Yeah. Well, and what did you think about the animated opening sequence with the cartoon Barbarian Brothers? It was cute. Like the song, it goes on just a little bit too long. Mm -hmm. I like the basic joke of they keep trying to help people and then screw it up. It fits the theme of the film. 
It's definitely not the best animated opening. No. Uh, that era, like, this was very common. Well, it's kind of like, you remember how Honey, I Shrunk the Kids had the opening animated sequence? Right. Yeah, it was very common for that period. And this is one of them. Yeah. It's nothing really special, but it was entertaining for a few minutes. But I think it just goes on a little bit too long. It's amusing, but it's very simply done. The actual artistry is nicely drawn, but the actual gags aren't really that interesting. They're not very well animated, and the weird color palette will just only have three colors on screen at once. Like, here's your orange, blue, and gray. It just doesn't quite work. Yeah. It drags a bit. It looks like, I know there's a lot of people who enjoy Schoolhouse Rock, but it kind of has a style that looks like the Schoolhouse Rock visual style. Yeah, I can see that. I'm looking it up. It was a Carol Holiday did the opening sequence, and she's been a storyboard artist and model artist for like a lot of Disney movies and stuff. I'm trying to see if there's like anything particularly significant that she directed. Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas... Not really seeing anything else that leaps out as like, hey, if you want to see more of her work, everything else, she's just part of an animation staff. Mm -hmm. It was an unexpected way to open the movie. Yeah. I had a big smile on my face when it first started. And then I was like, okay, these credits are going on a little bit too long. They need to shorten it up a bit. But other than that, I enjoyed it. I think it's interesting how it does play to... It is essentially a kid's movie. Oh, yeah. I'd say a slightly older kid's movie, given the sex scene. But the late 80s, kid's movies had a little more edge to them. Right. You know, they say shit and damn. They call someone an ass wipe. Not all of them have a sex scene, but it was still a funny sex scene for kids. Right. And uh, yeah, that was interesting. The one waitress at the diner who jumps the one brother because they're apparently in a relationship but doesn't realize that she's got the wrong brother. Are they in a relationship or is she just looking for a fling? She seems really surprised. Like It's the dinner stop with benefits. Right. Yeah. I think that's kind of what I got the impression of because she seems really shocked to see like it's the wrong brother. Like she slaps them. And you didn't say who you're looking for. So I get the impression that they come in there pretty often. Like, okay. I totally understand. He probably should have spoke up and said something like, hey, what's going on here? But she could have also been a little bit more like, hey, is this Victor or Rafe? Right. It's one of those ones where the questions of consent are kind of on both parties on them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we have the whole plot where these two are brothers who have such a reputation for always being late, even though it's often for helping people out, that they've sworn to each other, we're not going to help anyone out and we need to get this job done right. I was kind of surprised that, hey, this is the first time I think I've ever seen a film that has both Martin Mull and Richard Mull, who are two actors whose names I always get mixed up. I know, because I was like, we meet Richard Mull first, yeah. right? And I thought, oh, I thought that Martin Mull was in this film. <laughs> I was like, I must have gotten the names mixed up. And yeah. they obviously look very different. Because one is later in the credits, too. And it's like, when we get to the second credit, I'm like, wait, didn't we already see his name? Oh, what? <laughs> It's both of them. Right. It's like having Bill Pullman and Bill Paxton in a movie together. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which has happened on occasion. Richard Mull doesn't really have a big part. He's only in really one scene where he's their boss. But what'd you think of his performance? I kind of was surprised I didn't like him a little bit more. I loved Bull as a kid. He had great comic timing there. Here, he just seems to be the annoyed boss mm -hmm. and really doesn't have a whole lot of opportunity to really show off his comic chops. Yeah. If it wasn't for the fact that it was Richard Mull, it'd be kind of a nothing role, to be honest. I think he's he's making the part better than it is on paper. I mean, again, this is kind of a flatly made film. The actual writing of the script is not very good. A lot of the jokes are not very good on paper. It's more just about how they're played or all the funny business that's going on. But his jokes are strange, like how he's going through the whole tape of, you know, Here, I got all these messages for you, boys. And He lists three messages, but he's got like hundreds of little pieces of paper that he's flipping through. You could have been filling that time with some other jokes. Like, I'm sure he's just going off what the script says. There's just nothing there for him to work off of. And right. he's not really adding a whole lot to it other than, hey, it's Richard Mull. Actually, my favorite parts of the actual writing of the script are these weird little asides that we have. Like, you have these big, gruff truckers at this trucking company all start talking about their hobby of hand-knitting socks. Yeah. That was actually a really lovely scene. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Where this one guy notices another guy's socks, and the other guy's kind of embarrassed to admit that he hand-knitted them himself. And another guy's going, no shit, really, I hand-knit too. Do you, you know, what kind of needle set do you use? Yeah. And it was Tiny Lister, and I love that. Right. I like the fact that they actually included a little person actor, and they never make a big deal about it. No, he's just one of the truckers, yeah. Right. You never see him again. It's kind of a shame that you have this weird group of truckers around the facility, and we never see any of them again. Right. You kind of think, okay, A, around this time, having a little person in a role like this, you expect some sort of joke. Shtick, yeah. Or these are the crew that are going to back him up in the last act or something like that. 
And no, they're just there. Yeah, but they still get that one nice little scene. And then like even later on in the movie, there's just this one little out of nowhere sequence where two guards are walking by and they're having a conversation about, do you prefer microwaves or toasters? And it's like, right. you know, the benefit of a toaster is you can't make toast in a microwave. <laughs> yeah. This has nothing to do with anything, but it is amusing. Mm -hmm. And then we have the whole plot of the brothers still don't own their own truck yet. They're still late on their last payment. And there's a repo man played by David Carradine as Sweeney. Well, you see him early on, and I had no clue that was David Carradine until much later. The quality of the video that we watched was a little rough, but yeah. Yeah, that's true. But even then, like, he doesn't have a whole lot to do in that first act. He doesn't really come back in until close to the third act. He's fine. He's got a few jokes that make me smile. But for the most part, he's just playing slimy. I don't think yeah. he deserves what happens to him by the end of the film. Ha ha ha, radiation poisoning. Yeah, he's going to slowly <laughs> die. I mean, yeah, he took their truck, but at the same time. That was the whole funny bit was when he took their truck, it's like one of the vats suddenly spills over and starts spilling toxic waste. I'm like, oh, wait, where are we going with toxic waste? And it's like, <laughs> oh, ha, he's pulling out his own hair. Yeah. Ooh. That's a little dark. <laughs> That got dark, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would have been a better joke if their whole thing was they're transporting fertilizer and it all gets spilled on him at the end, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. Something that's not going to kill him of slow poisoning as his organs <laughs> fail. <laughs> right. And I admit, it's a dumb comedy. You're not really supposed to think about it, but... That was a tonal shift, yeah. I kind of got the impression like he lost his tooth as well because he's like picking at something in his mouth and he looks down at it and then he like scratches his back of his head. Then he pulls out a chunk of oh, hair God. and it's just like, oh God, this is your comeuppance for doing your job of repoing the truck. Yeah. Now, admittedly, he was a little sketchy. He was trying to get the truck earlier than he needed to. He punched one of the brothers out and was about to drive off with the truck. When I kind of love the whole joke that he doesn't know about second gear. Yeah. A repo man doesn't know how to drive a truck. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know if that was because their truck was custom or something like mm. that, because they also say the same thing about the girl, which maybe they just don't think a little teenager can drive a stick shift. Mm. But I don't know. I thought that was really weird. But that said, I still found it not a spectacular role, but I found it fun to watch because the thing about David Carradine is he's not always the most animated actor. Mm -mm. There's a lot of roles where he just looks really tired and stoned. But what I liked is that he's actually pretty lively in this one. He's actually kind of animated. You get to see him do a lot of really fun business. There's some fun stuff in his performance in this one. Yeah. There's just not much to the character. Like, I almost expected as we were getting into the third act that he was actually going to team up with the brothers. And it's like, if you get this delivery there on time, the truck is yours. If you don't, it's mine. You know, that kind of thing. But no. No. It's literally just the same bit over and over again as he keeps stealing the truck and they get it back. He steals the truck and they get it back. Yeah. He doesn't even team up with the other bad guys. Yeah. He seems like just an extra antagonist. I expected like a bit where he would steal the truck and then Richard Keel and his goons would jump the truck and find him in it instead. Right. That would make sense. They don't even get like a real victory over him. Yeah, he gets cancer, but he still gets the truck. He basically wins at least the battle, if not the war. Yeah. So then we get to the character of Holly Sherwood, played by Ari Myers. It is an interesting setup where it's this private company that will pay for the free education of these children, but basically kidnap these children and keep them locked up and own the patents of anything that these children invent. How she's come up with this device that can manipulate any electronics around it, and it's going to be sold to arms dealers. I kind of like the idea behind it. It mm -hmm. seems like a weird mishmash for a movie about truckers. To be honest, that's what I remember the most when I was a kid. Like, I remember the plot of this remote control. They keep saying it turns things off and on, but it actually seems like it just controls things as long as you have the right code to work it. Well, I mean, that's how you control electronic devices is you just alter where the current is flowing within the device. I suppose. Sometimes it turns things off and on. Sometimes it just turns a red light to a green light. So I didn't get that. Obviously, that does make a certain amount of sense. What I like is that it's not like an absolute magic device where they have full control over. Right. They can't make the car run by itself no. or anything like that. They can turn off the analog brakes but they can't make the car go left or right. I mean, it's a silly plot where she's basically made a TV remote that can control anything. However, I like that they don't overplay it. They don't overuse it. It can only really help out with little things like, you know, changing a traffic light, turning off their ignition. But because it's a new device, you don't always know what electronics you're triggering because I kind of like how it is like a remote control. You have to find the right code to fit the right frequency for the right thing. Like when you're trying to add a Blu-ray to your universal remote, right. you, know, you have to go through this whole list of codes before you find the right one. Mm -hmm. And it's like she knows what some of them are, but there's times when she uses a remote and it hits the wrong thing. 
I kind of like that, that it's actually not that unbelievable in terms of how they play it. Yeah, like you said, they don't overuse it. It's obviously the MacGuffin of the thing, Mm -hmm. but it's also not a magic device that can do anything that's convenient for the plot. It's not like making their car fly, you know? Yeah. Right. (laughs) It's not like a Herbie the Love Bug type of just what type of thing. Mm -hmm. It helps in little ways, and it's largely a MacGuffin. It's largely just a thing for the plot to revolve around. And you can see why it's a thing where it would have marketing applications as like having your own household universal remote, and it would have military applications in terms of it can stop a pacemaker or turn off a tank. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I'm surprised in the end where it's like, yeah, we just sold like 30 million units of the remote control that we need you to deliver. And it's like, (laughs) you're giving everyone the power to do everything. Yeah. She's got to have built some fail safes into that oh, thing, yeah. but that does seem a little like reckless. Yeah. All it takes is somebody to look at your patent and say, like, well, we can just redo this. And now we've got the same thing. And yeah. we didn't have to pay the company a million dollars for it, like the bad guys were trying to do. There are a couple of funny bits, too, where the brothers have it. I love when they're driving away and she gives them the first three digits of a code, but they don't know what the fourth digit is. Right. So they're just trying them one after a time and they're basically setting off different things around them as they're trying to get their truck to get through a green light and even as the police car is coming after them they're messing with the police car right and i do love the bit at the end where you know the one brother sees the girl and her boyfriend making out he sees his brother and the other woman making out looks to the camera and just holds up the remote and turns it off (laughs) and then the other brother yells at him or austin we haven't even finished the movie yet yeah it's cute and i've always appreciated a meta element to a film it was a device that I was prepared to hate, and yet I thought they played it in a very amusing, fun way. Yeah. And then what do you think about the character of Holly? I liked her. I think I remember as a kid, I had quite a bit of a crush on her. i really not familiar with Ari Myers, but I think she played the role pretty well. She actually sold the role of this kid who's pretty smart pretty well. And when she is stowing away in the back of the truck for the first time, and she's just listening to their conversation, she's like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, and then covers her mouth as she realize she just said that out loud she sold that bit pretty well well i love how she does it a second time when she sees them having sex in the other room yeah (laughs) like she just is somebody who just says things that come to her head Mm -hmm. and she's a brilliant genius of course she's gonna verbalize things because she's probably used to just talking to herself because probably a lot of the conversations she has with other people just don't appreciate what she's saying because she always tries to explain like oh well this works off the conductive and then blah 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 and she's a techno babbler yeah and they're like "Uh uh-huh so yeah i think she plays the role pretty well She is kind of almost the plot device, almost as much as the remote control in some ways. Mm. But I think that she adds enough to the role that it doesn't feel like that. Yeah, I think she's fun. She's one of those actresses where I think she's a perfectly fine actress. She had like a 20-year career before she finally retired, but never really hit any big projects. Yeah. There's a slight blandness to her, but she's charming and she's good. And I think she really fits in this role very nicely. And I like the way she bounces off the brothers. I like the way that she thinks they're ridiculous or like ways in which they're just like staring at her blankly as she's spouting their techno babble. Well, the way she plays, like she's first just completely trying to take advantage of them and is exasperated by their stupidity. But you can see her as the more time she spends with them. Oh, these guys are kind of fun. And as you as the audience, you kind of are along the same road with her. Right. You're like, oh, I can't believe these guys are so stupid. And then like, okay, they are that stupid, but... Right. Yeah. Like I love bits where it's like she steals the truck and then he'll be like, it's okay. She won't know about the second gear. And she figures out the second gear and just keeps going. And then what I love is the second time it's like they think she's stealing our truck. No, she's not. And she actually stops and lets them in. Right. It is a nice bond that's building between them. I don't know that we needed the creepy bit with the mustache dude hitting on her in the diner. Yeah. That was uncomfortable. It's one of those things that probably would not happen today. Yeah. At least not in a comedy. No, and again, this is, you know, the kids movie where, you know, she's like talking her way out of a situation with the bad guys by saying, I'm having my period, you know, and I like the other kid who is her friend at the school. Yeah. The one who's just sitting there picking his nose the whole time. (laughs) Even though he helps her out, even though he rats her out, but then helps her out by telling her that he ratted her out. Yeah. She was a fun presence. Again, I really like that there's never a creep factor. There's never any like them making eyes at a 16 year old girl. There's never anything like that. No. It's this very big brother, little sister type of relationship that forms between them all. Right. And then what did you think of Claudia Christian as Dr. Marsh? It's interesting because I've talked about this actress before because she was in an episode of Quantum Leap that I guessed it mm. on Calavici Fashion Cast. 
I've never seen Babylon 5. Oh, okay. I know that that's her big role, claim to fame. Oh, yeah. She was making a lot of movies like this around this time. Yeah. She has like one moment I thought was really good where she tracks down Holly to the motel where they're staying at and she ties up the one brother on the bed and he keeps breaking out of the ropes. (laughs) And so she knocks him on the head and then she just stops, grabs his arm and feels his biceps and then just goes back to save Holly. And yeah, that scene just cracked me up. The rest of the time, she was... Token love interest. Well, through most of the film, she doesn't even that. Yeah, that's right. She doesn't come back into the film until past the halfway point. Yeah, she's just kind of there at the beginning. She has a couple scenes with Martin Mull, and then up until the point where she tracks them down. And then all of a sudden, she's just on board yeah. as the love interest. And even when they leave Holly at her boyfriend's, it's like, yeah, she just hops back on the truck because she's part of the team now. Right. Like, here she's a psychiatrist for a pretty well-to-do company. Well, I'm guessing, again, she was hired to keep the kids in line or keep them motivated, and that's leading to a lot of her guilt. Right. She went to the same school that Holly was a part Mm -hmm. of. So, like, she's also apparently a genius of some sort as well. But she just seems there as a convenient love interest for somebody, for one of the brothers. I think Rafe? I can't tell. Wasn't it Rafe who was jumped by the waitress who's actually in a relationship with Victor? I think it was the other way around. Yeah. I See, I don't know. Yeah. They really need to do more to separate them personality-wise. Well, and one of the brothers did mention Donna several times throughout the movie, too, which was the waitress. So, Eh. obviously, they have something already going on. Yeah. But yeah, I don't think the Barbarian Brothers movies are ever going to do a successful job of letting you know which brother is which brother. No. (laughs) And which brother is played by which actor. Like, just color code (laughs) them. Like, And I know one has the black tank top. They both have specifically different tops, but I still don't know which brother is which. And I don't know which brother is playing which brother. And I don't really care because they kind of operate as a unit for me. Yeah. Any scene, you could probably switch out which brother is doing what and it wouldn't matter. I mean, but what I do love about that scene when Claudia Christian comes in the movie is, again, it takes this bit of an edgier tonal shift for a kid's movie where she sees the situation as the 16-year-old girl that I'm trying to find is in the shower of a hotel room with these two giant truckers that have been driving her across the country. And she's like, this is not right. Right. And so that's why she's coming in with a gun and trying to tie the one brother up. And the one brother is like, oh, I didn't know this hotel had a kink service to it. (laughs) Yeah. And he's like really kind of into it that she has the gun and is trying to tie him up, even though he's constantly breaking the ropes. And I love like he's never trying to like get the gun or fight her off or anything like that. He's just kind of having fun with her tying him up and he just breaks the ropes right off. Yeah. It's just such a weirdly played scene, but I really enjoy it. And then they all get pizza, tell their stories and hang out. Yeah. And I do kind of like that near the end, she is chanting along with them with her lucky mantra. And Oh, she gets really into it. Yeah. Yeah. Chicken bone, chicken bone. But she doesn't have a whole lot to her character as far no. as anything else. It would have been fun if she like tried to teach one of them to read and like he brought out a copy of Dostoevsky and it's like, trust me, I'm good. That would have been fun as, as like a teacher. She's trying to help them out and realizing they know more than anyone expects them to. Right. It's fine. There's not much to it. Claudia Christian is, I think what was great about Babylon 5 is that she is a very specific type of actor who didn't always work in every role that she was put in. And that was the show that really found a great role to put her in. Mm-hmm. This is still that part of her career where she's falling into very typical Tolkien roles and she's not a very typical Tolkien actress. And that's where it's kind of frustrating because it's like, I really like Claudia Christian, but this isn't really the best role for her. Right. So what did you think about Martin Mull as Dr. Bruckner? I really like Martin Mull. He's one of those actors who is always charming in just about every role he's in. He's always playing the same role, pretty much. Yeah. He's the put-upon guy who's... Sometimes he's a good guy, sometimes he's not. But I always find him just charming because he nails that role really well. I kind of had a problem with it because I think they're trying to sell him as having a little bit more edge than Martin Mull actually possesses because near the end, he's sitting across from Holly as she's got a knife to her throat and he's like, oh, well, just give me the remote. Nothing bad yeah. will happen. And I'm like, yeah, you're Martin Mull. I don't find you intimidating. Richard Keel is intimidating. Martin Mull is not. Yeah. And that's where he's a fine presence. I've enjoyed him in many comedies. I enjoy him in scenes in this, but this is a character who, as the situation plays out and he becomes increasingly desperate. There needs to be that darker edge. And it's like, you know, yeah, where he's getting to torturing the one kid for info on Holly, having her and her boyfriend tied up with a knife to their throats. You can tell the film is trying to convey that, but he's not fully selling it. Right. You don't get that increased desperation. Yeah. If they played him as more, like you said, desperate, where he's like, okay, this was just supposed to be me selling a device that one of my students made, and it spiraled out of control from there. 
I think it would have been fine, but the problem is that he just seems like, oh, well, she's gone, so I guess kidnapping and attempted murder is the next thing on the list. There's no real build-up to that level. I think it would have been great if he had played it with just a tiny bit more nuance of, oh, well, I didn't want it to go down this way, but this is how it ended up. Again, it is such a weird plot to have that tied to the whole Trucker Brothers. I would like to see more of this whole corporate espionage kids find. This would be a great plot for a thing where kids go to this private university for a tech giant and find this whole conspiracy to use their project for military applications. Uh, didn't they do that in Real Genius? <laughs> I haven't seen Real Genius, so okay. I mean, it's been <laughs> so long since I've seen that, I don't remember, but I think that was part of the plot. Okay, so hey, we got that movie then. All right, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's a weird plot. I don't think it's a bad fit for this story. No. Because I think the two sides do bounce off each other well. You know, the corporate versus the hardworking labor and man, if you want to find some level of thematic depth in what they're doing here. So one of the fun things about this movie is we kind of have this set group of henchmen that are always following our heroes around. We get the blonde German guy. We get a couple of other thugs. And then we get Richard Keel as their leader, Irving. Yeah, I love Richard Keel. Keel's fun. Whenever he shows up in anything, he's just a fun presence. Even when they have him playing bad guys, he just seems like this really sweet guy who's having fun getting to play these roles. Right. <laughs> What's kind of funny is they never really pit his quote unquote strength versus the Barbarian Brothers strength. There's that one bit where they're fighting under the truck but you know they never try to make him like super strong or anything like that he's just a big guy versus two very wide guys right i kind of love the line at the end i might be big but i'm not stupid (laughs) there's not much to the character he's literally just the goon who's chasing everyone around and being richard keel with his giant hands and his evil grin and i actually love some of the bits more that we get from some of the other guys yeah like we kind of get the weird nerdy white guy who's the martial artist Mm -hmm. we get the one goon i love the one scene where it's him versus michael winslow the comedian right he's like about to punch mike winslow michael is like not in the face not in the face And he ducks and then gets the table on the other guy. And the other guy is like, not in the face, not in the face. And then he slams the guy's face into the truck. Yeah. And then we have the German guy with the ponytail. I love, they have just one scene where he just gets frustrated and starts swearing in German. Yeah. I like character bits like this. And these are bits that feel like they maybe evolved on set or evolved over the course of making the movie. And and those are the bits that I kind of enjoy the most. Yeah. I mean, they're thugs. I mean, even Richard Keel is basically just the unique lieutenant thug, but he's not really much more than that. But they all seem to be having fun in their roles and they feel unique as opposed to like some of these films where, okay, I thought that guy got knocked out. No, okay, he's, oh, wait, that was the other guy, you know, that sort of thing. Mm Mm-hmm. I almost wish we had had like just a few more little scenes between them just as a group. Because again, remember how I like little asides like the toaster versus microwave or something like that? They need a scene like that. Oh, like bad guys is having like human moments. That's one of my favorite tropes. Have the bad guys talking about something completely mundane while they're getting ready to like kidnap a teenage yeah. girl. That's the type of stuff I just kind of chuckle at. Yeah, where it's like they're not bad guys because they're evil. They're bad guys because, hey, it's a job. Right. <laughs> they remind me of like the thugs in Iron Man 3. Yeah. Where the one dude is like, hey, they don't pay me enough. Go for it. Because we kind of had that scene at the end where it's like the truck full of toxic waste is on the train tracks. And they're like, nope. (laughs) Yeah, they're like, we're getting out of here. You're on your own. Even Irving, who's the last one who stays behind, that's where you get the, I would be big, but I'm not stupid. And they all just start like talking away. Mm -hmm. I like that. I was kind of almost surprised that the arms dealers didn't play more of a role as, you know, they're the legit bad guys. Right. Just to have one extra party chasing after everyone. I remember, like, from my childhood, the scene where they're like, oh, goodbye, Mr. Secretary, as Martin Mull used the device to stop the pacemaker. I forgot that they're not in, like, 99% of the movie. They're there yeah. at the one scene at the beginning and then at the very end. And one is dressed like Beetlejuice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's where, again, you kind of needed that ticking clock to up the desperation of Bruckner. Yeah, he's such a comic villain. He doesn't have any teeth to him. Having them come in at the end would have upped the ante just a little bit. Instead, they're just like, oh, well, we didn't get what we want, so we're going to just take Martin Mull away. No, yeah, there's no reason they wouldn't have also taken the girl to compel her to build another remote. Right. And that could have led to another fight with the Barbarian Brothers, Mm -hmm. where the remote is then used against them. But again, you know, they have the whole thing of, we destroyed the remote. Oh, but that was just the one from the motel. Right. (laughs) 
there could have been more exploration of that thread. Yeah, I felt like the ending just kind of happened. And again, if the truck was full of fertilizer, you could knock it on them too, you know? Right. This whole big thing where all the bad guys suddenly get fertilizer poured on them. I have a feeling this movie came out like two or three years later. That's exactly what would have happened. Yeah. I think they probably would have nailed it just a few years later. And I'm wondering if they just didn't have the budget to do anything too big. Yeah, that's possible because this film does not have a budget. Because I mean, the whole stuck on the train tracks, you can shoot that without much money. You drive off the train tracks and get some footage of a train, you edit them together. Mm -hmm. I think probably the most elaborate scene are just a couple of the trucks swerving around cars. Right. There's not too much money put in this movie, and that could probably be why even when you get the one toxic waste jug spilled, it's just some generic goo with some green special effects added to it. Right. Even like the fight choreography. Oh, again, there's not much to it. I like the slapstick, but yeah, there clearly it's done probably at the moment. Yeah. It was probably figured out on the set. Obviously, no real rehearsals as far as choreography was concerned. And surprisingly, I can't even find who the stunt coordinator of the film was. <laughs> no, I don't know if there was one. Yeah, I don't. I mean, there's like assistant stunt coordinator and a couple of stunt performers, but I don't even know who would like choreographed anything. I don't think there was anything too elaborate. No, probably not. And I even kind of noticed near the end, and special thanks to Roger Corman. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> trying to think of anything else about the film it's always cool to see michael winslow yeah we got michael winslow he just had a nice fun sequence in the diner where he almost takes holly the rest of the way but then gets chased off yeah he doesn't have enough time to really do anything no like he has one little bit of shtick where he's talking to the waitress and he's not doing his sound effects yeah he's not doing any of the sound effects bits that's surprising he's playing it very campy like a very silly performance he puts on a couple of funny voices but he's not doing sound effects he's not making helicopter oh. noises or anything i just had a thought about their complete Complete missed opportunity here. If you have Michael Winslow in a trucker movie, how do you not have him be a human CB radio? Yeah, I kind of expected that. Have him be a voice that they're always talking to on the CB radio, and then when they meet him in person, he's still talking like he's on a CB radio. <laughs> like even with all the static and breaks. That would have been perfect. I would love that. <laughs> they're like, we're standing right here. <laughs> <laughs> that is a complete missed opportunity for how you could have used Michael Winslow. And I, I'm kind of disappointed by that now, but it's still funny to see him. Yeah. They kind of just quickly exits the film where he's like, you brothers are on your own. And just like, he's gone. Yeah. He's like the other truckers. We don't we really never see him again. And it's one of those things where it's like, I guess the only reason why they had it is so that way she would go out to join Michael Winslow's character without the brothers. And then they can come in and stop the next time that the bad guys were trying to kidnap her. Yeah. Just basically another excuse to have her almost get kidnapped again and have a little bit of that action. Other than that, I think we've covered pretty much the majority of the characters. Wow. I'm looking up the woman who played Donna, the waitress. Uh -huh. Darcy LaPierre is a model producer, actor, and award-winning rodeo barrel racer. <laughs> She's also going to be in Double Trouble. So she's in two Barbarian Brother movies. I wonder if she was like dating one of them for a while. Maybe. She was most recently in A&E's hotly anticipated reality series, Rodeo Girls. Okay. <laughs> she's been married five times, including during the making of this movie. So who knows? She was married to Jean-Claude Van Damme for three years in the 90s. I'm just looking at her IMDb. She says that she's known for Street Fighter, Guile's Date. So yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Hang on, she has two marriages that overlap. Oh. She has one marriage from 1984 to 1993 and another marriage from 1990 to 1993. Either somebody put hmm. something going wrong or... <laughs> or there's a story there. But yeah, there's an interesting story that we're not being told. And then she was married to Ron Rice, the owner of the Hawaiian Tropic Suntan Lotion Company. Wow. I want to read her memoir. Yeah. See, there's no small roles. Yeah. Or at least there's no small actors. Wow. All right, our next spinoff is Chronically the History of Darcy LaPierre. Yeah. <laughs> wow, okay. But yeah, otherwise, I can't really think of much else to bring up in this movie. I still think it's a sweet movie. I legitimately enjoyed watching it. It had flaws, it had bits that fell flat, but it's like any time there was a scene that kind of dragged and fell flat, it would be followed by another scene that was really energetic and made me laugh. Yeah, I still stand by my not recommend, but I still have fun watching it. I don't think those are necessarily exclusive. No. I don't think a lot of people will enjoy this film. I think that I enjoyed this film. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of fun things to find here. It's not very good, though. 
It's just not very good. Well, but I also don't think it's very bad. No. There is a lot of stuff in here that is legitimately well put together. It's uneven. It's inconsistent. It definitely feels like a director's first movie. Again, it's shocking that within a couple of years, this director went from this to becoming a pretty major director. Right. Again, this guy did the National Treasure movies, which are considered modern classics. Mm -hmm. Silly classics, but fun classics. Yeah, yeah. They're well remembered. And again, like Cool Runnings was a massive hit movie that was only done like three, four years after this. Right. I'm not seeing a whole lot of a directorial eye, but there's a lot of cleverness to it. There's a lot of clever little moments and asides and ideas within it. It's clever in how it puts certain things together. There's a slight sharpness to it I wasn't expecting for it. It's not just a stupid movie. No. It's a rough movie. It's inconsistent, but it's not uninteresting and it's not uninventive. I think that's totally fair. I think that's a very good summary. And again, it's a really good showcase for the Barbarian Brothers. Oh, yeah. They're easily my favorite part of this film. And they are the film. Yeah. So that's- <laughs> well, yeah, but for a couple of meatheads... They clearly have a charisma to them. They have energy that they bring to the role. They're not great actors. But they're not untalented performers. Exactly. They bring a enjoyment to the role that I've seen like some other, you know, Hulk Hogan films or films with other like wrestler types, and they're not as nearly as entertaining as these guys are. Yeah, I have seen so many wrestlers turned actors who are not as enjoyable to watch as these guys. Every time the Barbarian Brothers are on camera, and this fits with the DC Cab and with the Barbarians and this film too, every time they're on camera, I'm smiling. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because of the visual of them, which it is a pretty ridiculous visual of them, but it is because of legitimate things that they are doing. It's the bits they're doing, how they're playing the bits, the business that they're doing, the way they bounce off each other, their physicality, their expressiveness. I'm enjoying them because of them. Not just because, you know, hey, look at these two silly guys. It's because they're legitimately putting things into their performance that are making them enjoyable to watch. Yeah, agreed. Again, I'm sad. We only have two more. (laughs) I know. I know. (laughs) Yeah. Again, Barbarian Brothers, I know you're listening. Come on. Do some more stuff. We miss you guys. Yeah. Well, I plan to get into that in the later bit of the episode. Their lives have gone off in very different directions. We'll get to that more when we get to Twin Sitters. I understand why they haven't and why they kind of stopped, but we'll get into that later. Okay. But still, it's I'm glad that we had their moment in the spotlight because we got some really fun stuff out of it. Yeah. And speaking of this film, again, my recommendation comes, it's not a film where I'm just like anyone on the street I'm going to put in front of them and say, you'll enjoy this because they won't. This film works for me a lot on the same level of The Wizard. I think The Wizard is a legit good, well-made movie, but it's not a movie that's going to play to everybody. Right. Because it's a kid's movie. This is a kid's movie, and it's a movie made for kids. Not everyone can go back and watch kids' movies Yeah, when they get older. Actually, when Holly says, oh, I think I have my period, it reminded me of The Wizard when she's like, he touched my breast. He touched my breast, yeah. Because that's that sort of thing nowadays you don't see in kids' comedies. Yeah. And what's funny is the way that it's played in both the movies is it's not really like an exploitative joke or a raunchy joke. It's just, it's an honest moment. Right. You don't see that level of frank honesty on screen that much anymore in kids' movies. You know, there's times when the kids' movies of that era can get a little too frank, like Monster Squad and everyone gay bashing. Yeah. But, you know, even bits like where, you know, something happens and a little kid will go like, oh, shit. It's like, that's what kids do. Right. (laughs) Kids will react to a situation by going, oh, shit, or calling the evil bad guy an asswipe, you know? Yeah. But again, the overall tone is it's a kid's movie. There's so many people who have a hard time going back and rewatching kids' movies, even the ones that they themselves liked, because they can't put themselves back in that mindset. And that's not a bad thing. But I think if you're one of those people who struggles with going back and revisiting kids' movies, like you can't go back and revisit the earnest movies without rolling your eyes, this isn't going to play for you. Right. If you're someone who can still go back and look at a kids' movie and appreciate it on that level, or you know, even me, I will watch a film like this and be like, I didn't grow up watching this as a kid, but it feels like the type of film I would have grown up watching as a kid, and thus I can enjoy it on that level. Right. And that's why it's right on the borderline for me, because I can look at it and see like all the things that as a kid I really enjoyed. I can also see there's a lot of flaws 
But those flaws are something that as a kid, I would have and did just completely like I didn't notice them at all. Yes and no. I think the thing about the flaws of this movie is we're not looking at it as this is how you could have made the movie better by making it more sophisticated and adult. No, no. we're talking about even as a kid's movie, there's certain things it could have done better. It could have had a better climax. It could have had some scenes that dragged less. It could have had some sharper writing here and there. Some of the humor plays flat. Even as a kid, it would be a scene where you're just kind of sitting there staring at the screen. And there is that one bit of weird editing near the end where they're talking about the foul-up clock. Yes. And it's so clearly obvious that they dubbed in foul-up. I'm guessing that they said fuck up clock. Oh, yeah. And there were a couple of other scenes I saw where it's like the pregnant mother is yelling and swearing and they dub over her saying shit. But then when one of the brothers is imitating her, he says the word shit. I guess they decided like maybe they wanted to make it a PG-13 or PG and they decided they needed to roll it back a little bit. Yeah, I think it's more just that level of between being a PG-13 and being PG. Oh, hey, it was still a PG-13 when they released it. Yeah. Which, again, I think the scene with Don is what yeah. would have tipped it over the edge. And also these scenes of endangerment. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. And, like, the scene of the guy dying or toxic waste poison. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those films where, again, I'm kind of glad we're doing this project. Because this isn't a film that I know I would have sat down and watched otherwise. See, this is a film I would have... I couldn't remember the name of it. And I didn't know the Barbarian Brothers. I'm sure if I Googled long enough, I could have found it. Twin Trucker's Kids movie, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of glad we had the opportunity to revisit it. Even if I don't love it as much as I did as a kid, no. I still appreciate being able to revisit it. Oh, yeah. This is one I'm not going to be like dusting off every year for a fresh watch, but I'm glad I saw it. I could see myself watching it again. And there are friends that I could see myself sitting down and watching with them to introduce them to it, just because I think it's fun. At the end of the day, it's a movie that's set out to be a fun movie, and it is a fun movie. And it has its flaws, but I still enjoyed watching it. Yeah. The Barbarian Brothers are fun. Yeah. I'm glad we're getting a chance to go over these films, and uh, I look forward to next time. I mean, you know, even if the Barbarian Brothers just started doing their traveling stage act again, that would be fun. <laughs> even without the weightlifting, just them being their brothers. <laughs> so next time we have Double Trouble. Double Trouble. Toil and I just trouble. had to say that twice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, and that one's going to be fun. We got a guest coming for that one. Ooh. Looking forward to it. That'll be fun. And it's a guest who I know is very, very excited to watch this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they are. I'm trying to figure out what's a good way to end the Barbarian Brothers movies. That would be a fun riff. Yeah, I don't know. You should end this podcast. I don't want to end this podcast. <laughs> that was funny was they brought that bit back in this movie. Yeah, but they the gave it to the, yeah, the goons. They gave it to the goons. Yeah. The one goon who has the board and the one has the chain. He's like, no, I want the chain. <laughs> you always get the board. <laughs> good night, everybody. Good night. Barbarians is a part of Schumacast, which can be found at schumacast.blogspot.com and on Stitcher. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. The music in this episode is Stars by Jack Locke and is used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Barbarians and Schumacast are in no way affiliated with the creators and copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended.